Next, we have Dr. Paul Coleman on innovations, bringing agape love and forgiveness into the family. Dr. Paul Coleman is a clinical psychologist for the past 36 years and has a private practice in Dutchess County, New York. His specialties include post-traumatic stress disorder and grief. He is the author of a dozen self-help books his first being The Forgiving Marriage, published in 1989, and his most recent book is Finding Peace When Your Heart is in Pieces, published in 2014. He has been a guest expert on numerous television shows, including Today, and has been interviewed in dozens of radio stations across the country, including WABC and NPR. Paul's avocation is acting. He has appeared in over 40, mostly amateur, stage productions and recently appeared as a grief therapist in the HBO series, I Know This Much Is True, starring Mark Ruffalo. Paul is happily married for 39 years. He and his wife have three children and four grandchildren. Dr. Paul Coleman. Thank you all so much. It is so wonderful being here and witnessing the stories everyone has been telling and your hard, hard work. And to be a, a participant here really feels like a gift and a blessing to me. <clears throat> when I was in elementary school, the teacher challenged us one day to write down the largest number. So my classmates and I began writing down numbers that ended with a long string of zeros and when that proved incorrect, we said, aha, and we wrote down numbers ending in a long string of nines. The teacher finally asked us if we could add the number one to the number we had written. Yes, and we realized we could keep adding ones forever, and the concept of infinity gave us an entirely new perspective. Prior to that day, we were in a place of transition, a staging area, if you will, in between our old understanding of numbers and a new way. It is that way in life. As we grow and mature and when we seek to forgive and love despite deep hurt and justifiable anger, there is a middle area we must pass through, a staging area um, that leads us from our current perspective to a higher perspective. All higher perspectives include virtues that aim for connectedness rather than division, peace, rather than hostility. Today, I wish to explore these middle transition areas as I talk about forgiveness within the family and how to navigate through these transitory uh, areas. With that in mind, I have four goals for today. First, to expand a concept which is a precursor to forgiveness. It's part of that staging area I spoke about. It's a mindset, and there can be no complete forgiveness, in my view, without arriving first at this staging area. Second, to present a simple method that can move you a step closer to agape love, and also to help calm a mind cluttered by thoughts and feelings that are in opposition to one another. For example, when a person wishes to forgive and simultaneously wishes to hold tight to their justified anger. This method can bring about a ceasefire within our own mind and heart and allows us to peacefully coexist with the opposing wishes and contradictions within ourselves. If we cannot do that, we might project one side of the opposing forces onto others, creating conflict between ourselves and them. A third goal is to help how to help family members better understand how unresolved issues from one's past can become hidden obstacles to forgiveness. And lastly, how to tap into the part of agape love and forgiveness that in my view is mysterious, unpredictable, and not fully accessible by goal-directed formulas. We cannot force this mystical aspect to present itself, but we can increase the probability it will become manifest. So let me get to it. In the process of finding forgiveness, somewhere between anger, hate, fear, on the low end, what we might call aspects of our lower self, and virtues such as gratitude, faith, forgiveness, and love on the higher end, what we might call our higher self, is this place, it's a bridge, 
a staging area uh, that, allow, that when we can reach it, allows people to remain closer to the goal of forgiveness without always tumbling back to the more limited ways of thinking. A good metaphor for this, I was thought of this a few weeks ago, my wife and I were watching a documentary on people who were climbing Mount Everest. Reaching the, mum, the summit of Mount Everest is agape love and forgiveness in this case. Now they have something called a base camp. The base camp is 17,000 feet up. It's not at the bottom, but that is where the climbers, if they need help, if they need to come back to rest, to get some food, they go back to their base camp. They don't go back to the bottom of the mountain. So this place, this middle place I want to talk about is sort of an emotional base camp that puts people closer to agape love and forgiveness, but farther away from the lower level emotions, anger, hate, vengeance, that type of thing. In the remarkable four-stage model of forgiveness developed by Dr. Enright and his colleagues, there is a concept in the work phase vitally necessary called accepting the pain. It means a person must be willing to bear the undeserved pain, not pass it along to others. Now in my clinical work, I expand this definition and I use it as a tool throughout the forgiveness process. I call it emotional acceptance and when I apply it a certain way, I have seen it yield very powerful results. Emotional acceptance is the kind of inner peace that develops when the, we process life as it is in this moment rather than how it should be. So in forgiveness within a family, one might build a bridge between the victim and the perpetrator. In emotional acceptance, a bridge is built between one's lower self and one's higher self so that the higher self virtues can take hold and lead to a new moral action. I like to call emotional acceptance similar to base camp on Mount Everest. You're not at the bottom, but you're not at the top. To emotionally accept a situation does not mean that it is good or desirable or tolerable. It doesn't mean it is acceptable in any moral sense. It does not imply indifference to the harm that happened. You can dislike what happened and at the same time emotionally accept that it did indeed happen. It does not imply passivity. The famous psychotherapist Carl Rogers said that when we accept things as they are, only then can we begin to change them. Emotional acceptance is saying yes to a reality we may not like so that it can be better understood and possibly transformed. It's a willingness to abandon our inner emotional fight that something should not have happened when it has happened. Author Joseph Campbell suggested as much when he said, we must give up the life we planned so as to live the life that is waiting for us. Without emotional acceptance, we have its opposite, emotional resistance, which moves us toward our lower self, the base of the mountain, and away from agape love and forgiveness, the summit. Dr. David Hawkins, in his book, Power Versus Force, explains that with acceptance comes a major shift in one's level of consciousness. In a non-accepting way of thinking, one's happiness depends on events out there unfolding in a manner one requires that makes out there one's potential adversary. So during the process of therapy, at some point I will typically ask family members to vividly bring to mind some unresolved loss or betrayal until they can actually feel it, feel the disturbance in their body, usually their stomach, their throat, their chest. And then I just ask them to ponder the words, I don't like what happened, but I accept it. And then I ask, do you now feel a lessening of that disturbance or an increase? If the disturbance is the same or it goes higher, there's some emotional resistance occurring, anger, guilt, shame, something. And then I can explore what that is, what those attitudes are that explains their resistance. So in that way, I use emotional acceptance as a tool throughout the therapy process to uncover unacknowledged feelings and beliefs that are getting in the way. While people often initially resist the idea of forgiveness as a therapeutic goal for reasons we all understand, they don't understand it, um, I find that 
people are less resistant to the idea of first simply accepting the reality of what occurred. And that opens the door to other questions I frequently ask, such as, now what would you like to see happen? And eventually people admit they're tired of their pain, they wish to release it, to find some level of inner peace, contentment, happiness. When people process what has happened to them through acceptance of what is, rather than how it should be, their mind begins to calm and more peaceful and hopeful thoughts emerge. This brings me to a second goal today, a second strategy that helps take you to emotional acceptance and it also moves you forward to compassion, which is necessary, of course. And that is the ability to hold opposing views, mixed emotions about a complicated issue without the reactionary need to have one view quickly rule out rule against the other, like I'm right, you're wrong, I want this, but I want that. A betrayed spouse, for example, might be torn between the desire to never again trust the unfaithful partner and also have a desire to rebuild trust. Such mixed emotions create internal tension. People often wish to eliminate the tension by impulsively choosing one side over the other to obtain a false sense of certainty when in fact the situation is much more complicated. Now we do see this in America today with people taking widely opposite views of complex issues, often clinging to the idea that their own view is morally right and the other morally wrong. Such thinking leads to inadequate solutions, demonization of those with whom we disagree, and sometimes violence. So what is needed in families is an ability to achieve what I call peacefully coexisting with opposites. It is the willingness to sit patiently with mixed feelings and attitudes, the ambiguities, the contradictions, and to sit with the inner tension that is created when you try to hold those opposites in place. This is particularly true that there's tension when the issues are serious and the stakes are high. We don't want to impulsively try to resolve mixed feelings in a way that creates more problems. The wrong way to re resolve mixed feelings are often twofold. To first split the complex issue into two ways of thinking, what we call dualistic thinking. Disown one of those ways and then project the disowned part onto somebody else. So the battle is now between oneself and the other rather than within oneself, which is where it should be. Or second, to frantically debate and overthink, never being able to arrive at a workable decision, thereby causing obsessive preoccupation <clears throat> by allowing oneself to peacefully coexist with opposites. We also reduce the probability of impulsively acting in ways that are contrary to our, ideal, our ideals. For example, opposing violence by being violent or imposing, opposing unfairness by being unfair. By not reflexively running toward a dualistic manner of thinking, black and white thinking, but instead balancing opposing thoughts, feelings, and viewpoints and all the ambiguities within, letting them peacefully coexist in our heart and mind, we have planted the seeds to compassion, which as we know is a necessary part of the forgiveness process. Compassion always, always goes beyond dualistic thought, beyond black and white thinking. We all have opposing forces within our own personality. We can be kind and unkind, humble and arrogant, selfish and selfless, and dare I say liberal and conservative. By acknowledging these opposing forces within ourselves, we can be less judgmental. By coexisting peacefully with opposites within ourselves, we can see more clearly our similarity to others, not our differences, the more separate we feel from others and their suffering, the less likely we will act with compassion. When we can walk between opposites, peacefully coexisting with opposites, we have a better chance to actively loving. Also, the opposing forces within ourselves often serve us. For example, a strong moral outlook balanced by humility can prevent arrogant self-righteousness. Family members struggling to forgive often create a tangled mess of competing thoughts and feelings. They overthink, they're confused, emotionally reactive, argumentative, not at peace. To help them calm the battle in their mind and lead them to this 
staging area, if you will, or base camp of emotional acceptance, which then moves you closer to agape love and forgiveness, there's an exercise that I teach. It allows people to obsess and ruminate when they cannot stop themselves. In fact, I want them to obsess and ruminate, but with one change, to incorporate emotional acceptance. I call this exercise the train of thoughts, and you might actually think of an actual train slowly going through a tunnel. The tunnel represents the mind as each car emerges from the tunnel slowly, one at a time, the car represents a single thought about the issue one is grappling with. There are two main rules in the train of thoughts exercise. First, every obsessive thought, one at a time, no matter how extreme, must be expressed and then restated with the phrase, I accept, at the beginning. So the thought, I am furious, becomes, I accept, I am furious. The next thought, perhaps, of, but I hate feeling that way, becomes, I accept that I hate feeling that way. A thought, I will never forgive my brother, becomes, I accept, I will never forgive my brother. Any thought expressed in the form of a question, this is rule number two, must be changed to a statement. So the thought, will I ever be happy again, might be rephrased to, I'm worried, I may never be happy again. And then further rephrased to, I accept, I am worried, I may never be happy again. Once a thought is brought forth, the client is asked to simply notice and express the next automatic thought. For example, the thought, I accept, I will never forgive my brother, might then be followed by, but we used to be so close, which then becomes, I accept, we used to be so close. The thought, I'll never accept what was done to me, becomes, I accept, I'll never accept what was done to me. So accepting a thought doesn't mean it is rational or morally acceptable. It simply means the thought exists in your mind at that moment. By accepting contradictory thoughts, such as, I accept I want to leave my spouse for cheating on me, and it's opposite. I accept I don't want to leave him because I still love him. We begin to peacefully coexist with opposing thoughts. There is no agitated effort to have one thought win out over the other. It's like putting down the swords. There's no sword fight in your mind. During the process, clients are asked to notice how the tension in their body shifts. For example, if a person says, I accept I may never be happy again, there may be more physical disturbance, perhaps in the stomach area. That just means there's more thoughts and feelings needing to be released and to continue with the exercise. Clients report to me that after accepting dozens, if not hundreds, of, accept of consecutive thoughts, they discover that no thought creates any noticeable disturbance, not even contradictory thoughts. Irrational or angry thoughts lose their emotional power. Now I have them revisit this periodically and eventually they get really better at it and they find that in their daily life when something goes wrong, they simply say, I don't like it, I accept it. And I even have them practice that over small things. You're in, stuck in traffic, I accept it. I don't like it, but I accept it. You spill coffee on yourself, I don't like it, but I accept it. They build up the notion of emotional acceptance. Now seeking emotional acceptance does help us to uncover resistances to forgiveness because if we're not accepting something, we're resisting it. But asking additional questions of family members helps tug out the resistances that are not always obvious. Now most people, many people, have had some painful life experience growing up that still affects them. We might call them dark moment stories. They represent some of the personal challenges people bring into their family relationships. Now it's always a good idea to work through some of those stories prior to getting married, but I find that marriage often becomes the vessel within which unresolved issues become exposed and hopefully resolved. Couples don't often see the ways, the subtle ways, these dark moment stories complicate their relationship. One mother was raised by an overly strict father, so she chose to be lenient with her children. But her husband compensated for her leniency by becoming strict. The woman then viewed her husband as the bad father 
thus recreating a relationship pattern she had hoped to avoid. So there are other useful questions in the process of therapy, many, many others, I'll mention three, that help families to understand better what are their obstacles to improving their relationships to getting to forgiveness. Question one, what did you wish to receive growing up that you didn't or you didn't get enough of? Common answers are protection, love, understanding, praise, fairness. It is highly probable that they feel they are not getting enough of that same quality now in their relationship. Another question, when you think of some early childhood trauma or event that disturbs you still, what negative belief about yourself emerges? Common answers are, it's my fault. I'm not lovable. I cannot trust. If such deep-seated beliefs get triggered by current events, forgiveness of past hurts may need to occur before forgiveness of current hurts can be completed. Now, when I talk about hurts, it's helpful to look at what I consider, there's broadly, there's three major areas of hurt that I want people to understand. They can be hurt because of what is a loss of being loved, a loss of lovability, maybe they were rejected, a loss of self-esteem, maybe they don't feel competent, they, they feel diminished by people, maybe they don't feel attractive. Finally, a loss of control, and by control I mean a loss of Healing, feeling like they have influence over the course of events. If something unfair to them happens, they get hit by a car or somebody betrays them, they've lost some control over their destiny. Those are the three broad areas. When I get people to understand what areas are their hurts filling that category with, I'll ask them, when you think of some early childhood trauma that disturbs you, how did you cope with it? How did you deal with it? How did you deal with those hurts in one of those categories? Common answers include rebelliousness, withdrawing in order to escape, vigilance, mistrust. Current relationship problems might now automatically be handled very similarly as the way they handled it growing up and therefore impedes the forgiveness process. For example, men whose father figures were abusive or unavailable often learned early on that talking about their feelings never helped and probably made the situation worse. These men, as adults, tend to be poor communicators. They also learned with their father unavailable or abusing them that they had to rely on themselves a lot more for their emotional well-being. They had to deal with school problems or friendships or issues about life on their own by trial and error. As a result, these men as adults don't like being told what to do. They also have ambivalence about intimacy. They want it, they don't trust it. So their relationships tend to be unstable. Close, uh, closeness followed by pushing away or pulling away and then desired by wanting more closeness. Now there's other questions one can ask to detect resistances to forgiveness. But as we come, become more emotionally accepting of realities, we also have to accept the reality of what we call the givens of life, the hard realities, such as life is not always fair, that if you live long enough and if you love hard enough, loss is inevitable, and that suffering is often necessary for personal growth and transformation. Finally, there's a quality to forgiveness and love that is mysterious. Some might call it mystical and not predicted by formulas. Forgiveness and acts of love can and do happen spontaneously or when least expected or because of random events that, that cause a shift in consciousness or a change of heart. It could be a news story that captures your attention, a casual conversation with a stranger on a train watching a inspiring documentary, moments that are unplanned, even statistically improbable, but that allow you to suddenly see a deeper truth. Here is one such story. In February 1971, Tony, a young boy about to turn two, went to sleep with a low-grade fever. When his mother checked on him in the middle of the night, she discovered his body temperature had soared to a horrifying 108 degrees Fahrenheit, 42 degrees Celsius. His temperature was so high, 
burn marks appeared on his forehead. Frantic, the couple awakened their neighbor, a physician, who advised them, don't wait for an ambulance. Time was of the essence. Tony passed away in his mother's arms on the way to the hospital. The diagnosis was sudden onset pneumonia. Nine months later, Tony's dad was in his backyard. He spotted a toddler's brown shoe underneath a pile of leaves, Tony's shoe. The unexpected find brought tears of joy to the family and made the upcoming Christmas holiday a little easier to bear. However, the couple dealt with their grief very differently. The husband withdrew, became emotionally shut down. The couple became lonelier. And along with other marital distresses and differences, a large emotional distance accrued between them. Finally, when their children were college age, the couple divorced, the house was sold. And years later, the mother moved across the country to be near her now adult daughter and her grandchildren. But 36 years after Tony's death, something else unexpected and meaningful happened, followed by something magical. Some might call magic grace from God. Some call it a small miracle or what psychoanalyst Carl Jung termed synchronicity, a series of random coincidences so improbable they appear orchestrated by some invisible hand to create a meaningful outcome. And that magical part is, I will tell you in a few minutes. <laughs> we call that a teaser. Back to the mystical aspect of forgiveness. A very simple way to construe the forgiveness process is a person goes from being harmed and victimized to taking responsibility for doing something constructive and loving to undo the damage. But at some point, the forgiving person must give up some control over their destiny by trusting, by taking a leap of faith, being open to unforeseen events. Forgiveness and agape love always makes one vulnerable. It is with this surrender of control that one must also accept uncertainty. Accepting uncertainty, not resisting it, and even embracing it as a friend implies a higher level of trust that in the end, matters can work out for the good, even if not in the way one hoped. I ask clients to consider what I call AFT, acceptance, faith, and trust. Whenever they are in a situation that creates emotional distress, especially anger. I accept my situation as it is, even if I don't like it. And I have faith and trust, it can ultimately lead to some greater good, although I may not know what that is or when it will occur. At this higher level of trust, the details of the future do not need to be known or anxiously awaited because clients are not locked in a mindset of how matters must proceed, what the final outcome must be, and in what time frame it must happen. With a trusting mind, they are open to inspiring ideas, ideas that a closed mind, possibly limited by expectations and beliefs imposed by one's family, one's peer group, or one's culture, would not that you have access to. It is here that deeper truths can be unearthed, and many deeper truths are paradoxical and they lead to great changes. To live, you must die, suffer. To be exalted, you must be humble. To embrace, you must let go. Here, one might discover a deeper meaning to one's suffering. Suffering is bad enough. The meanest form of suffering is suffering with no meaning. We discover deeper meaning when we can examine our past, however painful, however unfair, not with cynicism, not with despair, but with loving awareness. And then attach our personal story of loss or victimization to something greater, such as peace, generosity, compassion, forgiveness, love. It is in this place of trust and letting go in the name of love and forgiveness that meaning might possibly be discovered, but sometimes, Magic happens, too. And that is because I believe when we are acting with the virtues of our highest self, we attract more guidance that reinforces those virtues. That's when meaningful coincidences, synchronicities happen. 
that can make you view the human condition from a higher perspective. In the book, Carl Jung, Wounded Healer of the Soul by Claire Dunn, is mentioned a letter Jung received from an elderly former patient that summed up very nicely Jung's own thoughts. The patient wrote, out of evil, much good has come to me. By keeping quiet, listening, repressing nothing, remaining attentive, and by accepting reality, taking things as they are and not as I wanted them to be, by doing all of this, unusual knowledge has come to me and unusual powers as well, such as I could never have imagined before. 35 years after the baby Tony died in his mother's arms, a series of unexpected and unplanned events took place. First, the woman learned that her former husband, now in his late 70s, had been diagnosed with brain cancer. He had been living with a longtime companion. She was also elderly. She said she couldn't handle his illness, so she moved out and moved out of state. So he was alone. Next, his former wife, despite years of emotional complacency, flew 3,000 miles to Massachusetts and moved in with him to take care of him. There were days when his cancer was so debilitating, it was a strain for them both. But there were times they laughed. Warm and tender memories emerged. Love, in various forms, was clearly present. Forgiveness happened quietly, but deeply in their hearts. Now, ironically, the bed frame and the headboard of the man's bed was the same one the couple bought 45 years earlier when they married back in 1962. And I suppose it was this frugality of his, along with her loving and devoted presence, that gives special meaning to the idea that we should never throw away something that can be saved, such as a, a bed or a broken relationship. The man died peacefully six months later on Christmas Eve. But this example of agape love and forgiveness is not the end of the story. Magic also happened in the form of synchronicity. The year after he passed away, the woman traveled 3,000 miles once again to the East Coast to visit family. Now I know all of this because she happens to be my sister, Anne, Anne Marie. She's older by 14 years and she would not want me, want me to tell you that. Her husband, Philip, was my brother-in-law. Young Tony was my nephew. Now, Anne's home base during her stay on the East Coast was with an old family friend, Ted, at his home in Vermont. And my wife and I drove from New York to Vermont to see them. Now, coincidentally, our son was preparing to move out of our home to his first apartment. Upon hearing this, Ted, who happened to own a huge warehouse full of used furniture, told us to take whatever furniture we wanted that our son might find useful. Now, after a long hour of searching, we found nothing of real use that we could fit into our car. But just as we were about to end our search, I spotted a small bedside table, almost entirely hidden under a pile of chairs. It was dirty, it had some scratches, but it had a drawer that opened very smoothly We'll take it. Three weeks later, it was time for my son to move into his apartment. I picked up the uh, small table to put it into my car. Now, what I didn't know was that when my sister moved to smaller living quarters after her divorce many, many years earlier, she had to get rid of some pieces of furniture. And a few pieces were given to Ted, a chair, a couch, a small bedside table, the very table that I picked out for my son after an hour of hunting. Now, Anne was shocked when she learned that of all the hundreds of pieces in the warehouse, the very thing we chose was something she had once owned. Now, as I was placing it in my car, I heard a rattling sound as if something inside the table had shifted. Now, there is also a shift in consciousness when we move from hate to agape love and forgiveness. And the journey we all travel on life with many expected, unexpected paths can be long. But each journey begins with a step. And each step 
usually begins with a shoe. And when I opened the table drawer to see what was shifting inside, there it was, a small brown shoe. Tony's shoe. It had been misplaced during my sister's relocations to different apartments, was sadly believed to be lost forever. The first time it was lost, my brother-in-law had found it under a pile of leaves after they had started growing apart not long after Tony died. The second time it was lost, I found it under a pile of chairs after they had forgiven one another, not long after Phil died. Now, many coincidences had to occur for me to find that shoe. It had to have been forgotten inside the drawer of a table that was unwittingly given away, not just to anybody, but to Ted. My sister had to be visiting at the precise time my son was moving to his apartment, otherwise we wouldn't have need for furniture. Ted had to generously allow us to take whatever furniture we wanted, and I had to notice the table, even though it was almost completely hidden under a pile of chairs. If any of those things had not happened, there would, no be, there would be no story of Tony's shoe. And as it always happens, when love transcends pain, we no longer miss Tony terribly. We miss him beautifully. So to summarize, in any meaningful story of adventure, the hero, that's us, any of us, faces a serious problem, perhaps a betrayal, within a family and seeks resolution, perhaps to keep the family from breaking apart. But there is a catch. In order to resolve the problem, the hero must face obstacles from without and within. And in overcoming these obstacles, the hero may or may not get what they want, but often they get what they need. And what is needed is transformation to some higher level of consciousness. Such higher level of consciousness is accomplished when we move past the ego's insistence on being right or being superior or always in control and instead learn to accept reality as it is, to accept life's givens, then to make difficult choices for giving with an overriding trust that a good result can happen, although not necessarily what we expect, or on a result that we may ever witness. And then we have to patiently sit between opposites, managing the tension created by one's own mixed feelings, contradictory wishes, so that we can identify more with the suffering of others and nurture compassion so that deeper truths and meanings to suffering may emerge and so that remarkable coincidences might occur to help us appreciate the mystery and the mystical aspects of life and to welcome those mysteries to help us guide, to help guide us along our own life journey. And just as I learned as a boy when writing down very large numbers, we can always add one on and on to infinity. We can always, in our own journeys, add one more unit of love, one more unit of faith or trust or gratitude, or kindness, or hope, or compassion. You can always add one more, always. And if somewhere along the road of your own personal journey in life, you happen to lose a shoe, don't worry. Don't worry. I thank you so much for listening.